In this program, I want to look at various stresses that can affect equilibrium and thereby cause that equilibrium to change or shift. Let's begin with the equilibrium state. The reaction that I'm going to study here is this one. Phosphorus trichloride gas mixed with chlorine producing phosphorus trichloride. And here we can see the concentrations of the various species. So initially there was no product present and then I've reached equilibrium sort of at this time and beyond. So this blue line represents the concentration of my PCl5. The red lines represent my two reactants. So let's say the solid line is the PCl3 and the dotted line underneath the hydrogen. At equilibrium, I can say the following. From the last program, we've reached equilibrium. So this ratio equals a particular constant. Now, let's look at introducing a stress. So what we're going to do is at this point here, we're going to introduce something into our system. So let's take a look at our first stress. What's the effect of concentration? In my particular example, I'm going to can say, let's say we all of a sudden inject or add some PCL5. So our stress is we make the concentration of PCL5 go up. According to Lushatsky's principle, the reaction will then want to minimize that stress, which means the reaction would shift to such a way that it could use up that excess, that it will take that and somehow make that concentration go back down. So it wants to achieve this, to take it from here and reduce the stress somewhat. Now, it's not going to take it all the way back to the initial state, but it's trying to reduce the effect. Now, in order to use up this chemical, the reaction must proceed in this direction, which would therefore produce more of my reactants. So I would expect both of these to adjust by going up some. Now let's take a look at what effect this has had on the equilibrium constant. If I take a look at what's happened to the amount of PCL5, I started here and I finished here. So the amount of PCL5 has gone up. What about my two reactants? Well, again, they started here and they finished up here. So they also have gone up. So the overall effect on my constant, both top and the bottom have increased, is it doesn't change. K is not affected by changes in concentration. Yes, I did shift the reaction. However, the ratio of product to reactant at the end of the reaction will remain essentially the same. Let's introduce a temperature stress. The first thing to understand about temperature stress is it depends very much on the type of reaction that you have. So in this case, with the positive sign I can remember from energy unit, this is an endothermic reaction. In an endothermic reaction, heat becomes a requirement. So I can think that over here I've got some sort of heat plus PCL3. So let's look at the stress. Say we, we add heat. Another way to view this would be, say we make the temperature go up. So the reaction sh would shift in such a way to minimize this, so it, instead of adding heat, it would try to use the heat. Or it will do something to try to make the temperature go back down. If it uses heat, the reaction would shift in this direction. The forward direction would essentially use up and remove heat from the system, much the way it would remove the other chemicals. So shifting the reaction forward therefore results in an increase in my product. And at the same time, as I move forward, I'm going to use up my two reactants and they'll drop down some. What's been the effect then on my reaction constant? Well, I can see if I compare my starting and my final, the PCL5 has gone up. And if I look at my two reactants, they've gone down. So both of these species have decreased. 
So there's been an effect. We have here changed the value of the constant. In this case, we've increased the value of Kc. Now, again, it's very important to understand what side the heat term is on. Had this reaction been an endothermic reaction, we would have had a very different effect. Now, let's take a look at pressure. Now, pressure, I should mention here, really only affects gases. Let's take a look at what happens when we increase the pressure on a gas. So let's say we have a, a container. And in that container, we'll have some product, a reactant, I should say, and we'll have some product in there as well. If we take this container and we push down on the lid, so we push the lid, say, down to a location down here. So we've added some pressure. We made the pressure go up. Um, you could also look at it saying the volume has gone down. These particles that were up in this region are now going to have to move down here due to the change. So what we've really done is we've increased the concentration of all of the species. They're all essentially closer together. So our stress there, our pressure has gone up. The shift in the reaction then is it would like to make the pressure go down. The pressure goes going down would be accomplished by moving to the side with fewer gas molecules. Now the reason we know that is Avogadro's law, that pressure is proportional to the number of moles of gas. So if I go to the side with fewer gas molecules, I'll get fewer pressure. So here I can see on this side there's two gas molecules, here one. So this particular stress increasing the pressure or reducing the volume will drive the reaction in the forward direction. Now let's take a look carefully at what happens to our concentrations. When we apply the stress, we squeeze all of the particles closer together. So all of the substances will experience a spike or an increase in their concentrations. Now the reaction will shift forward to adjust to the stress. And we've mentioned going forward is going to make more of my product. So from here, we're going to get even more product and we're going to use up some of our reactant. What does this do to our equilibrium constant? Well, let's look at it again, comparing before and after. My top has gotten bigger. What about the numbers on the bottom? Well, remember I started here but the introduction of the pressure stress caused a big increase in them both. Now, I haven't completely minimized that. So I still have on the bottom numbers that were larger than my original situation back here. So as a result, top and bottom effects cancel again, and I have no effect on Kc. But I have shifted the reaction forward, but no effect on the equilibrium constant or ratio. My final situation is what happens when we introduce a stress of adding a catalyst. So let's bring over a energy diagram to perhaps best understand how this works. We can recall that a catalyst affects the activation energy. So let's look at the forward direction. There's the equilibrium, or I should say the activation energy for my forward reaction. And to go in reverse, a larger activation energy is required, this height right here. So that's the Ea for my going in the reverse direction. We remember that the introduction of a catalyst alters the path, so we reduce the activation energy. But we reduce the activation energy of both. So essentially, instead of being this high, they're now reduced to smaller 
activation energies. So I've reduced the ease of the forward reaction and the reverse. Essentially what that means is that I've made maybe that arrow bigger, but this one has also become bigger. The effects cancel each other out. So both activation energies are reduced. And as a result, there's no shift. Both forward and reverse reactions are affected equally, and the equilibrium constant stays, stays the same. So what would happen to my graph? Well, it would just continue on from where it left off. So that brings us to the end of our equilibrium unit. In our next unit, we'll take a look at assets and bases. Thanks for watching.